No. Uh, Catherine Campbell, Secretary of Department of Human Services. No, thank you, Chair. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Campbell, I just wanted to go straight to a question that I just asked previously from budget paper number four, to, just, uh, just to understand um, where, the, where to look for um, certain items. Just on uh, budget paper number four, page 122, under Department of Human Services. Senator, I'm just getting one on the CFOs joining me. So what page again, sorry, Senator? 122. Um, Department of Social Services, uh, sorry, Department of Human Services. Yes, Senator. Yep. We've got that. Senator. Okay, sure. Um, just in terms of the services for other entities and trust monies, Department of Human Services special account, would, would you be able to just explain what that is? Uh, I'll ask the CFO if he knows what that is. It's uh, other, we don't seem to we have don't, anything that, in it. So Senator Mark Jenkins, I, I, Chief I know Financial you don't Officer. have anything in it, but I'm just I'm curious to know what would that account be? Okay, and that's why it's why it's there. That's all. Uh, Senator, that's uh, an account that all departments would generally have potentially for monies that are received that uh, you don't quite know who it belongs to. So it goes into what used to be called trust funds, other trust monies, or it can be for. Um, services that you might be providing with other related entities, other departments, other agencies that are subject to a, uh, an arrangement, a special type of arrangement, but uh, it, it, it hasn't applied to us um, okay. in so, recent times. Um, so in terms of um, the department, uh, if I could just take you to uh, welfare recipients um, how does the department measure breaches with welfare recipients? Senator, are you uh, talking about compliance with the That's obligations? Correct. Yep. Uh, so we have a, a number of measures in our compliance space that deal with, so there's both departmental, which is how we have money for running the department, mm -hmm. and then administered funds, which are the funds that are drawn down to make payments to welfare recipients. So I think your question relates to the administered payments which we make to welfare recipients. Is that the case? That's right, yep. And so uh, compliance, uh, we have a measure about payment accuracy. Is that what you're looking for? I'm looking for the, the I'm looking for a couple of things here, Ms Campbell, and uh, what I want to understand uh, through the, uh, the books, but also through uh, some statistics I've received in terms of CDP job seekers, trying to understand um, how the department uh, measures <coughs> or monitors those who uh, breach uh, their CDP and how you then monitor what happens to those breaches and what happens to the money that, that they don't receive. So, Senator, this isn't specifically in relation to CDP, is it? We'll just see whether we can get some other officers. My sure. understanding is that yep. Prime Minister and Cabinet manage this. No, issue. they've they've handballed that to you guys, which is why I'm asking the question. Uh, well, yeah. uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to help you. We <coughs> might have to take it on notice because my understanding is that that is Prime Minister and Cabinet. We'll see whether we have an officer who can assist with that. But Prime Minister and Cabinet are responsible for those programs. Yep. So um, I don't think that we actually have even the data that relates to compliance with respect to CDP. All right, I'll just, I'll just uh, go help elaborate just to, to give you an understanding of the conversation. When um, Prime Minister and Cabinet's uh, office provides the providers with funding and the providers then have to find jobs for, for example, 100 CDP participants. And of those 100 CDP participants, they may f provide jobs for 50. The other 50 may breach and not turn up. So what I asked Prime Minister and Cabinet is, what happens to the money for those 50? And they said I had to ask you guys. 
Well, Senator, we don't administer CDP at all. And so if you're talking about the money to run the program... No, no, this no, is the no, money... no, 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 Ms Campbell. It's, it's not the money to run the program. What I've been told by the Prime Minister and Cabinet's office is that... Or, or, sorry, by the Minister and his staff, was uh, that they don't know what happens if a participant breaches because it goes into your domain. I, so if a, if a participant breaches, and someone will hopefully check for me this, yep. and they're not entitled or receiving payment, the money is not drawn from the special appropriation. Okay. So there is a special appropriation for welfare payments, yep. and those payments are drawn down for eligible recipients. And where will I find that? In so, which, which part of the budget? Uh, so that's probably under social services. Which I've, which I've got here in front of me, but um, just, you, if you can help me, Mr Jenkins, because I think it's quite important to understand where the, where the money goes. So uh, we're just looking at page 82. Of which paper? A uh, budget paper for one. Yeah, so 82. when you say where the money goes, Senator... Well, if it's not going to the, recip to the, to, uh, the CDP participants uh, who are breached and their mm. money stops for eight weeks or longer, mm. where does the money go? Well, the nature of a special appropriation is that money is only drawn down as it's paid. So okay, so those... where is it on page 82? Just so we can have an understanding then of how the figures, the dollar figures stack up with the number of breaches across the country of the money that's withheld. I'm uh, just... So, Senator, the special appropriation payments would be estimates of the yep. likely drawdown against those special appropriations on an annual basis. Yep. Okay, so where, where are we looking uh, at here? Who's on there? page 82? Where are they? So page 82, if you go across the top line... Yep, at uh, outcome one. I'm not, I don't know where CD, which payment you're talking about, so I'm not sure which one is. You're probably talking about New Start, do you think? Is that the payment type we're talking about? We're just... Most yeah. likely, yeah. So yeah. I'm just trying to work out whether New Start is in outcome one or two, but if you go right over to the right-hand side, you'll see very large numbers. Yes, absolutely. So they're the special appropriation estimates. Yep. But the nature of a special appropriation is that it is available to make those payments as eligible claimants or recipients claim. But if people are penalised and therefore not claiming those payments, the money, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just not drawn out of that special appropriation. So could you, would you be able to provide for me, and I don't expect you to do it now, but just how many people um, would not be receiving money that would be in that? OK, so possibly that's PMNC and the Department of Employment. Would be, PMNC would be the best people to talk to about which of the, the CDP uh, recipients are, are not receiving monies because we don't administer that but, program. Okay, so help me to understand this because if a CDP participant um, has a problem, they then ring Centrelink. So it depends. Um, so sorry, just, just let me finish. So, so they then ring Centrelink with w whatever that particular issue that is that they have, um, and. Uh, you know, some wait for two hours, up to five hours, uh, to speak to um, a Centrelink uh, operator. What uh, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to unpack here because it's so confusing for people out there. I'm trying to unpack here just what is the responsibility of Centrelink in this process uh, for that for that old man trying to ring up and find out after five hours on the phone. What, so it's, it's we would be very interested to find out this example of five hours because that's not our statistics. But I'm trying to understand when you say older person. Oh well, anyone. Any, so is this a, in this is case this it was related to CDP or is this relate not related to CDP? It's anymore? all related to CDP. Um, okay. Because so the participants have to actually ring to Centrelink. We might see whether we can find someone who knows the interaction with CDP. Okay. OK, thanks. Ms. Yeah, Senator uh, Jill Charker, uh, Deputy Secretary. Uh, we, as the Secretary's noted, uh, CDP is, has uh, 
prime responsibilities for that is managed under the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, as the Secretary has noted. Um, but the policy in relation to job seeker participation and compliance lies with the Department of Employment. Mm. Our role is around assessing job seekers' eligibility for income support, uh, referring job seekers who have mutual obligation requirements to CDP providers, making ongoing income support payments to those customers who are eligible and payable for those payments, identifying where we might need to do an employment services assessment to determine a job seeker's possible barriers to employment, assessing and applying exemptions from mutual obligation requirements for things like, for example, medical incapacity, cultural business and other special circumstances, administering the payment of the approved program of work supplement to job seekers who are participating in an approved program of work, such as Work for the Dole, investigating reported non-compliance with compulsory mutual obligation requirements and determining whether a financial penalty applies, and also supporting customers more generally through remote service delivery in remote area service centres and agent services. Okay, thank you for that, Ms Charker. All right, let's, let's go with your fifth point. Um, Investing, um, reporting, uh, investigating reporting of non-compliance. How many investigations into non-compliance have you had to have? I don't have the specific number here, uh, Senator, but I'm sure that we can obtain that. Yeah, that would be notice. good. If you'd like yeah. to take it on notice, that yeah, would be we can good. do that. And and what about the penalties applied? How many penalties? Yeah, um, similarly, I don't have the number of penalties available. Um, but, uh, no, I'm sorry, actually, I do. Let me take that back. So, um, so just to give you some, some figures first, um, between 1 July 2016 and 31 March 2017, so over about a nine-month, eight-month period, yep. there were a total of 431,150 compliance investigations that were recommended by CDP providers. And we also so was that across the country? Correct, that's yep. right. Okay, and and what was the outcome of those investigations? 431,150. That's correct, okay. that's right. Um, and uh, I don't have data on the actual outcome of the investigations. I can take that on notice. If you could. And yeah. what about penalties as a result? Of so um, probably the, the closest uh, info I can give you at this minute uh, would be that um, we ask, of course, CDP providers to report to us activity-related failures, so where someone hasn't actually undertaken an activity that they're required to do, mm -hmm. and they are averaging about 10,500 per week this financial year. So is this data, the data that we will have been given in cross-portfolio Indigenous estimates, that table that we've been given that says there's so many no-show, no-pay penalties, so many serious failures, so many serious compliance failures, et cetera? Um, I don't know if the data would be exactly the same, Senator, without actually seeing that, but certainly the compliance process has got similarities, I imagine, to that which you've just referred to. But I don't know the particular figures of what, you're, what you've received in that forum to be able to compare. Senator, I, I, I don't know that table, I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, Mr. Ch Ms Charker, can I just ask you, just 431,150 investigations, and that's just with CDP, how many other investigations um, with other programs do you have on average? Uh, I'll take that. I'll see if we can get that figure for you, Senator. I don't have it right in front of me this minute. Sure. We'll see if we can get that it. That would be good if you could, and yep. also in terms of the penalties for the other programs. What, what I well. can supply, Senator, in relation to that figure is that the 431,000 figure I just gave you yep. represents 53% of all compliance investigations. So clearly one could deduce the total number of compliance investigations if the 431,000 is 53%. Okay, so what is the, what, what, what's the process um, undertaken to investigate? How long does it take? Who's involved? Um, I might, I'll probably ask for additional support from one of my colleagues, but sure. essentially um, when there is a situation where um, a job seeker is required to fulfil particular activities as part of their job plan that they develop with their employment services provider, 
There can be occasions, of course, where they actually don't undertake those activities. So that might be, for example, not turning up to an appointment. Mm -hmm. It could be um, not undertaking a particular course of training. It could be not attending um, a specialist or some other appointment, depending on what's in their job plan. And uh, subject to that, um, the job search provider who manages the relationship with um, the job seeker initially would make a decision about whether or not that activity not being undertaken um, constitutes some sort of participation requirements failure. Um, if, if in the event that there are a series of participation failures, the um, job services provider may refer those to the Department of Human Services for further compliance assessment. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Ms Chalkett, can I just um, ask you then around um, income support eligibility? Yep. What makes a person eligible for income support? There are um, several different types of income support payments yep. and the particular circumstances of a person will determine which payment they might be eligible for. Most income support payments are associated with some form of income and or assets testing. Um, but for example, um, the New Start payment, which is probably the most relevant in this case, um, a person would become eligible for it if they're currently um, of a certain age, if they're currently without a job, um, if they meet relevant um, means testing uh, requirements. Um, and then presumably once they, um, if they were accepted for a payment, they then become eligible to have to, required rather to undertake mutual obligation requirements as part of that process. But to go back to your question, there are a couple of different types of income support payments mm -hmm. um, and they are different in terms of the particular situation of the claimant. Uh, for example, disability support pension is another type of income support payment but clearly arises from a different set of circumstances than would a claimant seeking or getting new start. Okay, so uh, what about... Um, what about the way you engage with people in, through, through Centrelink? Is, are there outreach to communities or do people have to come in to... Senator, we'll just ask uh, somebody else to come to the table to talk sure. about how we do this. We have uh, a number of uh, remote service centres as well as a remote servicing mm -hmm. program yep. of activity, as well as a broad range of agents and access points where people are able to access uh, services. But we'll just okay. see whether we can get someone with some statistics on that. No worries. Thank you. Senator Mark Ledoux, General Manager of Face to Face Services. Yep. Can I just get the question again, please? Uh, just um, in terms of, we, we were just talking about uh, the income support eligibility and how that's explained, and I asked then, uh, how does, how do you reach out and engage with people? Do you go out to the communities, or do people have to come into the offices? How? We have a range or of services, Senator, that, that range from what we would know as our normal sort of service delivery offices. We also have agents across the country, predominantly in remote areas, rural areas. Um, access points which provide services, but predominantly uh, just access to our phones and computers without assistance. And then we have remote servicing, where we proactively, um, effectively move, fly in, or drive to remote services and provide those services on a face-to-face -face basis. And has that been increasing or decreasing? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. My okay. understanding is remained static for some time. Okay, so there are no offices or no reduction in, in outreach in any offices across the country? We, uh, Mr Ledoux's team, look at um, requirements, uh, number of people who need services and they may adjust programs, some more in one location and less in another, but not across the board there hasn't been any decrease no. in, in services in recent times, Senator? Okay. So can I just go back to the, C the program in terms of the department's role in the CDP program? Well, what exactly is your role? 
So this, uh, Ms. Dr. Charker took us through all yep. those those initial referral points. Mm -hmm. The actual conduct of CDP is not done by the Department of Human Services. So PM and C. PM and yep. C manage that process. Okay, and and does the department oversee the comprehensive compliance assessments? Um, the department uh, certainly has um, a role um, in investigating reported non-compliance with compulsory mutual obligation requirements. It, sorry, it does. Is it so just, yes, it does. Enough. Yes. Okay. So how many have you done in the year to date? We probably have to take that on notice, okay. Senator. Um, Are you, you're only interested in CDP at, at this stage? Yes. Participants. Thanks, Ms. Campbell. Um, uh, so it's CDP participants are twice as likely as other job seekers to be found non-compliant through the CCA process. Does DHS ha have an explanation for that? Senator, I think this is, we're not as deeply involved with CDP as, for example, PM and C would be. Mm -hmm. and, and I think PM and C have a much greater understanding of how the process works and, and what um, generates non-compliance and goes through to CCAs. So I think in the first instance, they are still better positioned to be able to answer these questions about the CDP program itself. So, so you have nothing to do with it then? Uh, what we've said, we've gone through all yeah. the parts that we play in the process, but the actual CDP process, the, the program itself is mm. um, run by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. They then refer people back to us for complex uh, assessment. So what's CCA stand for? Complex uh, compliance. Assessment. Complex compliance assessment, and then we work with those uh, participants to determine uh, what's going on there. But the actual program itself um, mm. is run by PM and C. So, so, so who's who's conducting the CCAs for remote Indigenous clients then, yeah. Ms. Chapman? I'd have to take advice. I'll take. We'll check that, Senator, and and confirm. Okay. Uh, also, could I have an understanding of their qualifications? Mm -hmm. um, are there any interpreters? Senator, as a general, uh, at, we work in community with p interpreters. We, we try and use interpreters when they're available or we use phone <coughs> yeah. lines. We often use a number of our staff. That's good, Miss um, Campbell. local language. That's good. I just want to understand how yeah. it's... Um, I, want, I just want to know how it's broken down, that's all. Um, so what oversight does... Um, sorry. I've gone through that with you, but what funding um, or how much is the funding do you receive specifically around CDP? So, Senator, we're funded on a per recipient basis. And how much is that? Uh, we have a different amount per employment, per um, type of payment. So we get a different amount for New Start okay. Aged Care. How much is the New Start one? Uh, I don't have that with us, Senator. We'd have to take that on notice. Okay. so. If I could have a breakdown of how much per part participant for each, um, whether it's New Start, Aged Care, Disability, if I could have those figures, that would be very good. Thank you. Um, so which Centrelink phone lines are CDP clients expected to ring for assistance? Uh, send, we'll see whether we can find out which number they're meant to ring. Is there a general compliance line? Uh, I've thought, we'll find that out in the next couple of we'll minutes. We'll just find that out in the next few minutes okay. and give you that number. And just what is the current wait time uh, for that phone line? We'll see what numbers we can get, Senator. And does the department collect data on the number of calls it receives by geographical location? It's hard to know sometimes where calls are coming from. I don't think we're able to capture that. But if you're speaking to a client, wouldn't they identify who they are um, and where they are? They may identify who they are, but not necessarily where they are. Okay. In, in many of these cases, when they're accessing our phone lines from either an agent or a uh, one of our remote service officers, then we would okay. probably so do know. You, do you monitor a client who's rung in <coughs> and says, my name is uh, Joe Brown. You look up Joe Brown, his birth date, and you see that perhaps he comes from Hermansburg in Central Australia. Do you monitor that? When you say monitor, what would well, you mean? Just, just what you've answered the question previously. So um, we would... N like, do you collect data on those calls? I don't know. We yeah. have many calls. I don't think we collect on 
where they're individuals. No, we don't, Senator. Okay. We'd know that the person called in because we would put it in their record if there yep. was an adjustment, but we don't. We don't record where the calls come from. You don't recall. You don't record where the call, or the or, or where the caller is from. Uh, is that's correct. Is that I, what you're I, saying? I don't think so. Um, Senator, um, Mr. Barry Jackson, Deputy Secretary for Service Delivery Operations. Um, firstly, I can go back to your uh, earlier question about which phone line. Yes. Um, there is not actually a dedicated phone line for CDP, but there are people would call in on their particular um, line that they wish to make inquiries on, whether it be a new start line. Um, and we can certainly provide information as to the wait line, wait times for the various um, phone lines that we do have in. Yep. Um, and we have provided that previously to the committee, and so um, that's a fairly standard question that we do get on a sure. number of occasions. And do you provide interpreters? Say, for example, Pirinjara, Aranda? Uh, we certainly Lurucha. provide interpreters. Yep. Um, and equally, um, as the Secretary mentioned, we also have a number of uh, Indigenous servicing officers um, out in the, the um, communities, um, which do certainly assist with. Um, and how many of those officers are there? Um, I can find that out very quickly. Th this is Indigenous officers? That's correct, yes. Yeah, if you could, that would yeah, be great. Absolutely. I'm sure someone will bring that to the table. Could you also provide how many um, Aboriginal interpreter languages you use yep, for it, yeah. the uh, thousands and thousands of CDP okay. participants? Absolutely. In, we in can those. provide that information. Okay. Um, and at the last estimates meeting, we certainly heard that 29 million calls couldn't get through to Centrelink. Um, do you take this into <coughs> account when CCAs are conducted? In what regard, Senator? Oh, well, just in terms of the com comprehensive compliance assessments. So, um, are, are you conscious of the fact that if, if uh, someone's trying to ring in uh, in relation to the fact that they may have an issue, but if they can't get through, is that taken into consideration once there is a discussion around any delays? So there are discussions on an individual basis about why someone has failed to meet their um, obligations. I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure whether we track whether people have said calls, because there are other ways of contacting us. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, I just have to finish now with one more uh, point, Ms Campbell. Um, I've certainly been around Central Australia and in terms of wait times, uh, I have been told that it is two and, in one instance, five hours that someone sat on a phone in a community uh, which had no mobile phone coverage. So I just want to relay that, um, that there are serious issues there about access to Centrelink. And phones. Senator, when we um, hear about anomalies like five hours, we can do service recovery, we can go through our records and try and determine what actually happened? And we are able to do that if people can give us specific details. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you very much, Senator McCarthy. Look